allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rip. Just pray with me. Father, we are assembled here tonight to do the business of the Ponca City Board of Education. Please be with our board members as they make decisions affecting our students and staff. These board members volunteer their time to serve this district and should be commended for that service. Again, be with our students and staff as we take on this time of year with testing. It's stressful for all concerned. Allow them to succeed in their endeavor to do well. Please be with our men and women of the armed forces as they serve our country with pride. Be with them as they fight to protect us here and overseas. We ask this in your name. Amen. Be seated. Jan, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Clark. Aye. Dr. Kincaid. Uh, Dr. Kincaid's about 10 minutes out. He'll be here. Okay. Mr. Newsom. Here. Mr. Riley. Here. Mrs. Troop. Present. Okay, our first order of business is the oath of office for Marvin and Don. I guess Gary will do it. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I hereby declare under oath that I will faithfully perform the duties of member of the Board of Education of the Ponca City Public School District of Ponca City, Oklahoma to the best of my ability and that I will faithfully discharge all of the duties pertaining to said office, all the duties pertaining to said office. And, obey the Constitution and laws of the United States and Oklahoma. So help me God. You're here by sworn in. <laughs> Gary, I'm kind of surprised you don't have that memorized. <laughs> Once a year. I have the alphabet memorized, but I do look at it every now and then. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next order of business will be the election of the board officers, the clerk, and the deputy clerk for the board who shall serve for a term of one year. And I believe Dr. Pennington will administer yes. this one. Yes. Do we have nominations for board president? Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Do I have any other nominations? Any other nominations? Nominations are closed. Um, all those in favor of Marvin serving as board president, say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. All right, Marvin. You're now get change seats. You get the gavel. <laughs> get the name tag. Marvin, now you need to take nominations for a vice president. And nominations for vice president? I'd like to nominate Judy as vice president. Second. Been nominated in second. Are there any other nominations? <clears throat> if not, then I call for the vote. Anyone voting for Judy for vice president of the board? Say aye. 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 Ice carried. Congratulations. Now we need clerk and deputy clerk. Okay. Uh, do we need to make a motion for Mary to be at service? Mary Ladd, service. Clerk. I'll, I'll make a motion that Mary serve as clerk. Is there a second? Yes. It's been moved and seconded. 
any other nominations? All in favor of Mary Ladd serving as the clerk of the board, say aye. Aye. Okay, Mary, got it. Okay, for a years. assistant clerk or deputy clerk. I believe Mary's that, that's Betty does that. Betty yes. Johnson's our Betty. deputy clerk. Betty and Johnson. Betty Johnson as uh, Debbie Clark. I'll second that. Okay. The motion has been made and seconded to nominate Debbie Johnson or Betty Johnson, Betty Johnson for the Deputy Clerk. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, that carried as well. So congratulations to Betty, wherever she is. That's okay. Are we with everybody through there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Move on to the presentations of the Employee of the Month Friend of Education Awards. We the first one will be for actually for the month of February as a certified employee, Tina Fisher. Obviously, she's not familiar with this. <laughs> Tina Fisher. Tina Fisher. I probably ought to get my glasses on for this. <laughs> Tina Fisher's areas of expertise span far and wide in our district. As a district PLC chair, she has helped guide and direct teachers toward our district vision with the support and resources they need. As a KEYS trainer, she is instrumental in providing concrete strategies and instructional techniques that are so valuable to new teachers in our district. Many times, Tina has given her time to help with district curricular needs by serving on curriculum committees. The knowledge she brings as she works with others to make instruction more effective is essential to district goals. She does all this because her first and foremost focus is to help kids be successful. At Woodlands, Tina wears two very different, but two very essential hats. She is a half-time counselor and half-time curriculum specialist. During the course of any day, Tina can be found leading grade level PLCs, contacting local agencies for family support services, modeling lessons, researching curriculum needs for teachers, helping students find productive solutions to problems, implementing state testing, <laughs> listening to staff, listening to parents, listening to students, and finishing up with a goodly share of lunchroom and playground duty. <laughs> Tina has also been known to ride in a red wagon and convince teachers to dance at our morning assembly or to feed a goat a bottle, a bottle to help motivate students. <laughs> Tina's office is rarely empty as she is the respected friend and coworker whose leadership helps our school be successful. Woodland School is proud to recognize Tina Fisher as the certified Teacher of the Month. I need to get a hard copy of this. It's going off on me. Okay, our next presentation is for our Certified Employee of the Month for the month of March. Jill Henderson, Principal at Liberty elementary Jill Henderson our principal is a blessing to Liberty Elementary on a daily basis she greets our students each morning with a welcoming smile and offers kind words to help them start the day on in a positive way she knows each student by name and many of the parents as well she is present in classrooms, during students' lunch, and on the playground at recess. She fills the role of a disciplinarian, of course, but also takes time out of her day to celebrate student success as students come to share joyous moments from their day. Just as she has a positive impact on the students, Mrs. Henderson affects the Liberty staff in the same manner. During the 2013-2014 school year, she willingly took on the role as principal mid-year when others may have been hesitant to do so. She works hard to establish and maintain a positive work atmosphere for everyone in the building. Her door is always open. She is approachable and supportive. 
If she doesn't have an answer, she will help find it. She offers constructive criticism and has established positive expectations for her staff. She recognizes the traditions established at Liberty and offers support to keep those going. She also provides fresh, new ideas to help our students to succeed. For these reasons and numerous more, Mrs. Henderson is deserving of the honor of being named Certified Employee of the Month. Thank you. Our Support Employee of the Month is Ellen Harris, Secretary at Woodlands Elementary. This one kind of makes me sad because after, um, after Ellen received the notification that she had this award, um, actually before, anyway, <laughs> this is her last year with the Punk City School District and after 24 years, she will be retiring, which is a good thing for her. So we're very excited for Ellen, but very sad for our staff. Ellen Harris has been a loyal Ponca City School District employee since 1990. It is no wonder that Ellen has found her niche as a support employee, as so many have depended upon her knowledge and expertise throughout her career. Over the years, Ellen has served as a teacher assistant and administrative secretary at central offices, and for the past 14 years as the office secretary at Woodlands Elementary School. Ellen wrote the book on multitasking. <laughs> Besides being an expert in all areas of secretarial duties, she compassionately adds a Band-Aid and a hug when playground injuries end up in the office. She celebrates with students over the loss of a first tooth. She assists and encourages students who need a quiet place to work away from the classroom. She has the ability to locate anything that is missing without raising an eyebrow over who left it there. <laughs> And Ellen can patiently unjam a copy machine long after others have given up. All this is done amidst teachers or the principal who look to her for solutions to just about any problem that presents itself. Ellen actually thinks before she speaks, which is a phenomenal characteristic. <laughs> this is why our staff looks to her often for wisdom and advice. In our school district, a secretary's job is never stagnant. There are new programs to learn, professional development to attend, and always added details to the job. Ellen takes this part of her job very seriously, studying and learning so she can offer help to make others work a little easier. Ellen is often called on by our district to guide and assist at other sites. Her experience and willingness to help makes her a valuable asset to all schools. Ellen never complains, whines, or grumbles Never, <laughs> but always keeps a positive attitude. Woodlands Elementary is extremely fortunate to have Ellen Harris on our team. We proudly recognize her as the district support employee of the month. <laughs> we congratulate all those who were recognized tonight. And Mary, you want them in the back? We still have one more. Oh, one more? Oh, oh, that's right. Sorry about that. Friends of Education, Cheryl Price from Volunteer at Trout Elementary. Thank you. We've got two ladies. Before we get started, though, I just want to say thank you, Ellen Harris. We spent nine years together. We started out together. Thank you for all those hours of counseling you did for me. <laughs> And thank you for finding everything just like they said you did. Thank you, Ellen. This is Cheryl Bryce and her daughter, Virginia. It's an honor to present Cheryl Bryce with the March Ponca City Friend of Education Award. Cheryl is the mother of Rick, a sixth grader at West Middle School, and Virginia, a fifth grader at Trout Elementary School. Mrs. Bryce is an involved parent at Trout Elementary. Twice a week, she helps with small reading groups in fifth grade. We appreciate her consistent attendance, and we say consistent because that's so important when volunteers come in. Cheryl supports our students with their reading fluency practice. Fluency is a foundational piece for learning content subjects as a child progresses through school. Cheryl is active in the Trout PTA. 
She has a smile that radiates with our students, staff, and parents. You might see Cheryl leading the egg drop game during the annual extravaganza or challenging students to try their moves on the dance floor during the recent sock hop. Wherever Cheryl pops up, you can guarantee she is praising and motivating students to show their best to the world. We appreciate her positive spirit. Thank you again for your support of Trout Elementary, both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. It, yes. Mary wants to take pictures. All right, we'll move on to section 4.1, nope, to 5.1, comments from the public. I understand there are a couple of folks that would like to make comments. Uh, Anna Scott, <coughs> I give us your name and your address. My name's Anna Scott, 340 South Palm. Um, what group are you with? Ponca City Association of Classroom Teachers. Good evening, Dr. Pennington, President Clark, and members of the board. My name is Anna Scott, and I'm the president of the Ponca City Association of Classroom Teachers. I wanted to speak to you tonight and tell you my thoughts on the upcoming March 30th Brighter Future Rally. As you know, last week, Dr. Seuss Week was celebrated in schools across Ponca City and in America. One of Theodore Geisel's beloved tales is of an elephant in a jungle who champions for the well-being of a speck of dust on the top of a flower. Unbeknownst to the rest of the jungle, particularly a grumpy kangaroo, there is a tiny city named Whoville on the speck. Only Horton the elephant can hear the cries of help from the patrons of the tiny city. The kangaroo thinks Horton is an idiot and gathers a mob to destroy the speck. Horton stays the course, keeps the speck safe, and eventually the cries of the Who's in Whoville are loud enough that the jungle animals, including the kangaroo, can hear them. Just in the nick of time, too, because they were almost destroyed. You know, our student situation in public education is very similar to the Who's in Whoville. They are floating on a speck, crying out for help to a grumpy kangaroo, the state legislature, that won't listen. And we, the parents, teachers, school staff, administration, and Ponca City community members are just like Horton. We are the champion in the story. We keep the students safe until their cries are loud enough to hear. My fear is that without help, the voice of public education won't be loud enough to hear. It is the desire of PCACT in conjunction with OEA, the State School Board Association, and COSA to go to the Brighter Future Rally to support the PTA in voicing our concerns to the legislature. Please vote yes to change the snow date March, May 8th to March 30th so we can be the Horton for the students of Ponca City. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. And Carrie Officer. I was gonna just stand up here and say ditto to what Anna said, but um, I'm Give Carrie your Officer. Name, your name and Carrie address. Officer, um, 916 North SH, and I am the Woodlands PTA president this year. Um, I just wanted to come and real briefly say that our PTA um, definitely encourages um, you guys changing the date from May 8th to the 30th of March so that um, more teachers would have that chance and that opportunity to go down. I know that made a big impact last year. And um, so the PTA, we work as hard as we can to be there, but I know it, it's, a, it's a bigger impact and a bigger influence. And we still have a lot of changes that the, the state needs to hear about and needs to make. So everyone that can be there would be great. So just allowing them to have that opportunity through that day would be awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, moving on to 6.1 and 2, superintendent's report. Okay, just want to take an opportunity to update the board on legislation, and I'm not going to go through every piece of legislation that is uh, currently still alive at the state capitol, but I want to bring a couple of pieces to your attention. Uh, House Bill 1290 is a um, piece of legislation authored by Dennis Casey, who uh, is in Morrison, which is pretty close. He actually represents a small part of the Ponca City District. And what this bill would do is a, what they call the School District Unfunded Mandate Relief Program. You know, we always talk about unfunded mandates and what a burden it is for school district. What this piece of legislation would do would, after the state board uh, determined how much each mandate cost per school district, if the state was not picking up 75% of that cost, 
then local boards would have the option of opting out of whatever that state requirement was. Now there would be some pieces, some things specifically exempted from that. A teacher salary schedule would be something that would be exempted. So uh, that's the latest attempt at uh, relieving us from unfunded, man unfunded mandates. That's been a popular topic in the legislature for the last few years. Um, speaking of unfunded mandates, um, one bill that has uh, survived and I think probably will be passed is what they is a bill called the Chase Morgan Sudden Cardiac Arrest Prevention Act. This is Senate Bill 239. And what this requires districts to do, or the State Department of Health to do, and the Department of Education, is develop and, and publicly post guidelines and other relevant information to students involved in extracurricular activities about the risk of sudden cardiac arrest. Um, uh, Chase Morris was a young man who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, died after, after I think it was <coughs> the first day of football practice. and. Uh, and his death was caused by sudden cardiac arrest, which is uh, a, a heart problem that typically is not diagnosed until after somebody dies. Um, so uh, uh, again, a well-intentioned uh, piece of legislation, uh, one that uh, obviously we support, we think students ought to know the risk of, of participation in extracurricular activity. Uh, one thing to remember is because of action by the board, uh, we actually have uh, uh, AED devices uh, at, uh, is a part of our uh, equipment that our coaches have available to them uh, at all our practices and all our games. And we also have those devices in all of our buildings. So, uh, you know, if something were to happen and we did have a cardiac situation, we're prepared to uh, respond uh, to that event. Okay. Uh, Let's see, there are several bills uh, that involve charter schools. Um, one of those, uh, Senate Bill 302, would allow uh, federally recognized Indian tribes to sponsor a charter school. Um, and then we have uh, 1783 by Clark, Clark Jolly, which is one that would uh, allow charter schools uh, to receive state aid for facility use, acquisition, and or maintenance. You know, when the charter bills first came into being, uh, they were, uh, they, there was no provision made for facilities. And the, uh, and kind of the, and the, the belief was that, uh, that that was something they would not need facilities for. They'd be able to secure facilities for, through either donations or very low lease payments. Uh, we now see that, uh, that now that charter schools have been around in Oklahoma City and Tulsa for a while, they now want funding to help with their facilities. It's a, you should remember that the state of Oklahoma does not help any public schools with facility costs. Uh, they don't provide funds to build buildings. They don't fund, provide funds to pay electrical bills. They don't provide funds to remodel or renovate. Um, so obviously I'm very concerned about funds, something to allow, give money to charter schools that not, does not give it uh, to public schools. Uh, the bill that is the most controversial right now is Senate Bill 609, and that's the bill that would create an education savings account that would allow parents to pay for a private school tuition, uh, private or parochial. Uh, if, you got, if you read your email, the uh, School Board Association has just conducted a statewide survey uh, of this legislation and has found that an overwhelming majority of Oklahomans are not supportive of this bill. Uh, but it is a bill that has lots of support from out of state interest. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's a, a bill that uh, I think that if you took a vote today would probably pass in the state Senate. And so we're obviously encouraging uh, all members of, of school boards and teachers and the public uh, to uh, make sure their state senator knows how they feel about this bill. Uh, the, uh, uh, again, the, the legislation is presented as a non-voucher bill because it doesn't take money directly from the state treasury. What it does is allow these parents to receive a tax credit. Uh, the, uh, you have legislation like this that is passed in Florida and in Indiana. Um, and you know, if you if you read the stories about the legislation, it's been used for not only private school tuition, it's been used to buy televisions for the home, it's been used to go to trips to Europe, it's been used for lots of things other than just 
the education of people's children. Um, and uh, they're still, the, the author of the bill is still making, is, has made some changes. Originally the bill included homeschool students. Homeschool students have been removed. But remember about pieces of legislation, you know, what, what, what changes are made to it to get it passed, you can be assured those things are gonna come back in later sessions of the legislature. House Bill 1696 is a charter school bill that would, uh, that would make charters uh, possible statewide. Uh, the difference in this bill is it would allow the local, it would put the local board of education in control of determining whether, starter, whether charters are started or not. And there also are some, some uh, requirements that have to do with accountability and, uh, and other restrictions on charters. So in, in some regards, it's a, uh, it's a better version of charter bills that we have right now. Uh, the fact that it would give the local board of education the authority to decide whether a charter would be granted in a local school district, I think is an improvement. And then I'm very supportive of the accountability measures. Uh, that charter schools would be would be just as accountable as traditional public schools are for not only uh, how their money is spent, uh, but also uh, what percentage of their funding is spent on administration, and then uh, whether their students are making academic progress or not. And then the same penalties that apply to the public schools would also apply to the charters. Um, my best guess is that, uh, that this bill is probably going to pass and it will pass uh, kind of as a, as a compromise to the voucher bill that, you know, if, if behind the scenes that the voucher bill is stopped, then the agreement will be that the education organizations in the state will not uh, oppose this particular piece of legislation. I still would encourage you to let uh, your, our state senator and state representative know how you feel about these pieces of legislation. Uh, Senate Bill 706 is a bill that would uh, delay the implementation of the teacher leader effectiveness requirements until the 2017-18 school year. They are scheduled right now to go into effect 2015-16. Uh, we, uh, we've had part of that already. The state board has already suspended parts of those parts of that legislation. Uh, if you're in the curriculum committee, you know that, that, that uh, Barbara uh, made a presentation on SLOs and SOOs and SORs and all those acronyms, which I can't tell you what they all mean. Uh, but those have been delayed uh, until further notice. And this would just put the whole thing off for another year. I think, or another two years, I think the, the hang up and the, and the real issue they're having trouble with is the growth model and how to determine whether a teacher is contributing to a student's growth. And, uh, and, and that seems to be the most controversial part. From a district standpoint, we don't have any problem with the quantitative piece, and that's the piece that we do where our, te where our principals go in and they evaluate teachers. Uh, we think that's been a positive change and we're very supportive of that. But the section that deals with t student test scores and how they affect a teacher's rating how much of a percentage of that they are, uh, you know, uh, we would strongly advocate that those percentages be lessened or maybe they even be removed until we adept, adopt a state testing system that measures student growth, that really measures growth. And exactly, you know, what you'd have to pretest in the beginning of the year, you'd have to test again at the end of the year so that that individual teacher could be, would, would be the only, would be somebody that you could definitely say, this particular teacher influenced student academic performance by this amount. You know, we do that right now with our MAP assessment. It can be done, but it really takes a test that's specifically designed to do that. The next piece of legislation is Senate Bill 707. That was scheduled for a vote today, and I've not heard how that came out. But what that piece of legislation was gonna do was it was gonna turn control over high school assessments to the State Board of Education. The, the purpose of the bill is to end the EOI process and to replace it with, either, with the ACT and then some other models of assessment. Uh, the test that the Career Tech gives to students to demonstrate that they've gained the appropriate skills in the, in the areas of study that they've participated in. 
um, so that uh, the state board would be able to adapt those assessments as we move into the future for what is more appropriate for students. Um, obviously, we, we think that's a good idea. The, the main benefit of this is students would be taking a test that matters to them. You know, right now, EOI tests uh, only matter for EOI purposes. They don't really matter to high school students. And if you've had a child, a st uh, you're a child or a grandchild that's been through high school the last four or five years since we've done this, you know, you've heard that common refrain from them when we take these tests and they don't mean anything. Because they don't matter to the colleges, they don't matter to anybody else. And so uh, we support the movement to an exam that makes a difference, that matters to kids. Um, the, uh, the other bill, uh, just there's some work on reading sufficiency. One would take the RSA plans and bump them down to first grade so that when we assess students in the first grade, if we see a deficiency in reading, we immediately put those students on an RSA. We, I don't think we call it that already, but we already do that. I mean, we, we start identifying kids early and start developing plans for them once we see there's a reading problem. It also would uh, make a change in the committee. And right now, when it comes time to, in the third grade to make a determination whether or not a student be retained, the building principal is a part of that committee. This would take the building principal off of that committee. And then we have uh, several pieces of legislation, House Bill 1278, Senate Bill 162, that would make changes in the assessment of special education students. And it would uh, remove the caps on the percentage of special education students that their test can count toward proficiency or the grade card or however the school district is evaluated. Remember right now we have a cap of 2%. So we have special ed students who, who take a modified assessment, they test proficient, only 2% of those students can be counted as proficient. The rest of those students who took the test and passed the test, they're automatically reported as limited knowledge when it comes time to determine the student report card and those kinds of things. Uh, this legislation would go back and basically say that the IEP determines what kind of test a student takes. And, and we believe that the IEP should always uh, uh, be the decision maker on what we do with students on assessment. And then uh, the, uh, the last thing I'll talk about is funding. There are lots of bills, probably more bills this session than any time that I remember that deal with funding. And, uh, and have different ways to improve funding. Uh, the problem is there's no money to improve funding. And, uh, and so uh, while I appreciate the efforts of the legislature, the fact is we have a $700 million shortfall. And so uh, we'll probably be lucky if we just break even this year. And, but I do hope and I'm hopeful that even if there's not more money in next year's budget, that the state can at least start making a commitment to budgets in the future that, uh, that we're committed to improving funding for schools, that they recognize that, we, that, that they can't not continue to ignore us, uh, that the consequences that we're reaping right now will have a devastating effect on the education of kids, which is a segue into the rally. And what I wanted to do is just share with you um, the uh, talking points for the rally and why I would encourage the board when it comes to that appropriate time in the agenda uh, to modify the agenda for the, or modify our calendar to allow our teachers and staff to participate in the rally. Uh, there are basically two goals of the rally. The first goal is a high, highly, a high quality teacher for every classroom. Sorry about that. My youngest son who never calls me decides to call me in the middle of a board meeting. <laughs> uh, the first one is a long-term plan to improve teacher compensation for regional competitiveness. Um, and then policy changes to strengthen and sustain the teacher pipeline. Um, you know, I, th I think the first, the first one is a, is, is a stat that I think will probably get worse before it gets better. 
and that is that in this current school year, we're a thousand teachers short in Oklahoma. And what that means is we have a thousand positions across the state that if school districts could find a certified teacher to fill that position, they would hire them. So that means those are positions that right now that are probably be, are being filled by long-term subs, short-term subs. Maybe they have a teacher in the building, teachers in the building that are teaching on their conference period. But we have a thousand positions statewide that are open. We have 500 positions that are being filled by emergency teaching certificates. Those are individuals who do not meet requirements to have it to be teaching whatever position they hold to be in those positions currently, but they're there on emergency certification. And I know Shelly's not here tonight, but I think we have five people in our district who are working for us on emergency certifications. Um, and, I, and I can tell you until two years ago, during my previous eight years in this district, we didn't have people on emergency certificates. We just didn't do that because we didn't have to do that. We were able to find people to fill those positions. Um, and so you can see the rest of this. And then the next one is common sense testing. And I think if you look, you know, at the legislation that's been proposed, you can tell that the legislature has gotten the message loud and clear that we need to make some changes in the state testing program. Um, $17 million a year, 26 tests each year. Uh, you've all heard reports in the past that, were, that Barbara's made about how much time it takes to test. The, uh, the administrative uh, nightmare of scheduling tests, of trying to find people to help come in who are not teachers in the district or not employees of the district to work as monitors on assessment. Um, you know, 26 tests don't seem like very much, but when you look at how many schools that affects, how many monitors we have to have, how, many, how, much, how much that changes class time schedules, testing is a real burden for us and in every school district across the state. Um, and you can see some of the solutions that they've offered for that. Um, people ask me all the time, did the rally last year make any difference? I can tell you it got us a lot of national attention. Um, as you know, I've had the opportunity this last year to, to meet with several different groups from across the country, and we're not very long into the conversation until they asked me about the rally and how did we do it and how did we ever get 25,000 people to go to the state capitol in support of public education. Uh, I assure you that the $40 million we got last year in the formula would not have been in the formula if we would not have had the rally. And the change that was made to third grade assessment, which uh, removed the mandate that a student who did not pass the CRT test uh, be retained, but instead set up a committee that looked at several factors to determine retention that also allowed students to take alternative tests uh, during the academic year and over the summer to allow them to go on to fourth grade. That would not have become law without the rally. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big supporter. I wish we did not have to do this. Uh, I wish we could uh, rely upon the legislature to uh, pass legislation that was positive for education without having to take time out to do that. Um, you know, uh, one of the kickbacks we always get on this is, well, you know, you're giving teachers a day off. I would just remind you that, uh, that our teachers will work every contract day that they're contracted for, even if we make this change. And also a reminder that, you know, teachers are parents too. And, uh, and you know, all citizens have the right to uh, petition their government for redress of grievances. And I happen to believe the education community has got lots of grievances right now, the way education policy operates in Oklahoma. Um, but I'll get, get off my soapbox. Anybody have any questions about the rally? Now, you know, there is one thing I want to make sure you're very, you're, you're very aware of. And it's just one of those things. I wish it was not this way. But if we do make a change and make the May 8th date the date that we exchange, the snow day we exchange, 
that means that we will have a three-day week that week because the other snow day we have on our calendar is April 3rd, which is Good Friday. Um, we have surveyed our staff and parents, and um, Barbara, is it 68% or 72%? Do you remember off the top of your head of the survey responders? 68% of the people, we asked that question of a survey, and 68 of the, peop, of the survey responses that we got back were in favor of using the May 8th date and just having a three-day week. Um, you know, it, what's important to me is that we go to the rally, whether we use April 3rd or March 3rd or May 8th does not matter to me. I would just tell you there seems to be strong support for uh, maintaining April 3rd as a snow day and continuing and then go ahead and use May 8th. Um, you know, I'm just thankful that we didn't have to use a snow day this year and we have this option. And uh, so does anybody have any questions about the rally or about any piece of legislation? Okay. All right. That's all I have, Marvin. Thank you very much. Uh